I'm going to share with you my testimony this morning, and I use the writings of Acts, the testimony of Paul, not because I'm like Paul. Never give up hope, either on yourself or on others. God's got an answer for every prayer. And that's the third point, God answers prayer. I know at one point in my, you know, you have these points, and and sometimes you can remember where the Lord, you know, was really working. I mean, I don't have a place where the Lord knocked me off my horse like Paul or Saul, but there, you know, there are these points where you know that the Lord spoke. It's a patient, protracted process. But one of these was I, this was back in my party days, and I'm getting ahead, but just to emphasize God's answering prayer, I was um, with a bunch of my buddies, and we were partying. In fact, we were smoking marijuana, which at the time wasn't legal. I guess it is now. <clears throat> Strange world. But in any case, uh, we went, of all things, to a passion play. I mean, why are people smoking pot going to a passion play? Who knows? But there we were, right? Um, and the interesting thing is, the Lord spoke to several of us at that passion play, even though we were smoking pot and just kind of you know, not even, weren't sure why we were there. <clears throat> in fact, three, of, there was five of us, three of the five ended up becoming strong, um, born-again Christians. I was the only Adventist, but two others became Christians, and none of us were heading in that direction previously. So, and we, I know there were people there that were praying for us, because they, you know, they kind of saw us and smelled us, <laughs> you know, coming up. And, uh, the thing is, they never knew the answer to their prayer, right? They didn't know. They were praying for us. I know they were. But they did not know the answer. How many people have you prayed for and you don't know the answer? That doesn't mean God didn't answer it. Amen? Amen. So please keep these things in mind as I share the story of Paul and then my testimony. All the city was provoked, and the people rushed together. And taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. While they were seeking to kill him, and they weren't just planning it, I mean, they were trying to do it, a report came up to the commander. Uh, This would be the uh, Chiller Ark, which would be a leader uh, over a thousand men. So the report came to the commander, the Roman cohort, that all Jerusalem was in confusion. At once, he took some soldiers and centurions, that is, heads of hundreds, and ran down to them, and when they saw the commander, and the soldiers, the people, stopped beating Paul. They would have killed him otherwise, but God had other plans. So Paul was persecuted, but he also had a pedigree of righteousness, according to the law, that is. Look at verse 22, verse 1, and onward. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia. As he said further up, this is no mean city. This was a great city of learning along the same lines with Athens or Alexandria. But God saw something in Paul. God sees something in you. Amen? Amen? goes on in verse 4. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council and the elders can testify. Talk about name dropping. The high priest, ask him, Paul says, or Saul at this time. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. And then something amazing happens in his life. But it happened that I was on my way approaching Damascus. About noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven around me. I fell to the ground and heard the voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am 
Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. Those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one speaking to me. When God comes, when God speaks to you, maybe nobody else around you is getting that same vibe. Amen? He speaks to us individually. And as we saw in verse 6, God takes the initiative. He knocks you off your horse. Sometimes. He speaks to you individually and calls you to action. Verse 10. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go. (laughs) Get up and go. That's what he calls us to do in Paul's case, or Saul's case, into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that you are appointed to do. And Saul's thinking, yeah, but you know, I've got one problem. I'm currently blind. And so he said, no problem. A certain man, Ananias, he would go see. They held him by the hand, verse 11 says, and brought him into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very time, I looked up at him. Verse 14, and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and what you have heard. Have you seen something? Have you heard something? Verse 16. Now why do you delay? God's call is a timely call. Amen? When he calls, the first time he calls is the best time to answer. Amen? He he may call. He will call many times. But it's easier the first time, I can tell you. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. All right, well, my testimony could be called the blind leading the blind, and you'll know why as I go on. Grew up in southern Florida, and so I give you this background so you can see the contrast. It's always about glorifying God, you're our testimony, amen, not us. But sometimes you need to know a little bit about what someone came out from to understand what they were saved to. Grew up in southern Florida, and all of us kids, we would always say there's nothing to do. How many of you kids have ever said that to mom and dad? Now you've got, I didn't have, I didn't have a cell phone at the time. <laughs> there's always something to do, I guess, but you know, so that was our excuse. There's nothing to do. So what did we do? We found the worst things to do. <laughs> I mean, why, I could have started a business. I mean, I could have done many positive things. But no, we decided to get into lots of trouble and uh, party more than uh, most. And of course, any partying is bad. And so that was kind of the upbringing that I was in. I'm the youngest of eight children. Well, one friend was out in California. And he went by Zig, and he had gotten kind of tossed out of the Navy, let's say. Um, And uh, anyway, he was out in San Diego, and he's like, Rob, he's like, if you think you know how to party in Florida, you've got to come out here. We really know how to party. So I'm like, okay, that's what I'm into. Let's do this. So I load up my Plymouth Fury with all my goods in it and start driving from Florida to California. It's a long drive. I took 40. I've driven that many times since, at least from Michigan to California. But here I was on Interstate 40, and I was going through Texas. How many of you have ever driven across Texas? It's a long state, isn't it? So I'm going about 100 miles an hour in this Plymouth Fury, which is way too fast in any situation. And, um, And I'm also smoking marijuana, and I look back, and I see what I think is smoke. And I'm like, oh, no, I just blew this thing up. I'm not even gonna make it to California. Fortunately, Uh, So then I start slowing down, and I get down to about, I don't know exactly, around 50 maybe, and I have a front tire blow. Now think about this. If that front tire had blown at 100, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you right now. 
So it was interesting. And the, the engine didn't blow. It was a freeze plug that had blown. And so this was steam. The water was hitting the manifold and steam was coming up. So $1,500 later, I'm back on the road. I make it out to California where Zig is. And um, we continue the party life. I start working at a place that makes giant inflatable replicas. So if you've ever seen these big Coke cans, 20 foot tall, and there's a squirrel cage fan that feeds it, that type thing we made. <clears throat> One day I was lifting a big roll of material and I hurt my back. Well, I had been going to a chiropractor pretty regularly, but it wasn't really, it didn't seem to be going anywhere. And my friend said, you gotta go to this chiropractor. That's a, you know, that's a friend of mine. My dad goes, he's a trucker. He always gets fixed. This guy's good, you gotta go. And I didn't really want to go because the other guy hadn't been really seemingly getting any results for me. Uh, but I said, okay, I'll go. I decided to go. He said, there's a few things I have to tell you about him first. I'm like, okay, shoot. He said, the first thing is he is about 80 years old. And I'm thinking, okay, because I know he's got to do all the, you know, the manipulations, right, and cracking and stuff. And I'm like, is he going to be able to do this? Uh, but the second thing was, he told me, he said, he is blind. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go to a blind 80-year-old chiropractor for medical services. <laughs> this doesn't really sound like that great of an idea. But somehow he talked me into it. I don't know if it was the brain cells I had burned previously or what, but there I went. And this man's name, if this whole story wasn't my story, I don't know if I'd even believe it. His name was Frank Nightingale, related to Florence Nightingale. Just crazy. He wasn't born blind. Uh, he actually um, blinded himself in a fit of rage in an argument with his dad. He went out in the backyard and kind of put, you know, sand in his eyes and stuff. It, amazing, amazing. So here I show up at this Frank Nightingale's house. He's a blind chiropractor. His wife, Doris, comes out to greet me. And I'm already thinking in my mind as I'm pulling up to this place, you know, if I was blind, I'm not sure how happy I would be. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I'm thinking, you know, is this guy going to have a chip on his shoulder? Exactly what's going to be coming out of here? But Doris comes out, and she's the most godly Christian lady that I think I've ever met. Just a sweet smile. There was something about her that you could tell was different. You know, I'd been looking for happiness, I suppose, in all those things, right? Drugs, alcohol, other things. Um, never found it. And here is a lady that has it. Then comes out Frank. And actually, when he came out, I still remember it vividly. There was sort of a narrow hallway that he came out, and he was kind of, you know, it, he sort of knew where he was going, but he was kind of banging off the walls coming out. And then he, he reached to shake my hand, and I was still sitting, so he kind of caromed off my head. And I'm like, oh, this is, I'm not sure about this. But even with all that happening, there was something about Frank I could tell was different. He had a piece that I didn't have, and he was blind. I couldn't explain it. But I was ready to listen, and he was ready to share. And once he gets you on that table, <laughs> you're not going anywhere. You're sort of a captive audience. And he shared with me over the period of a year um, the God that he knows and loves. It was just amazing. Actually, I wrote a little bit about it um, here. <clears throat> Before long, he began to converse with me about what God looked like through his eyes. God was out there seeking to save every lost soul. He cared about every problem, and he was the only one with lasting solutions. God's love loomed so large in Frank's eyes that no physical malady on earth could blur his vision. He was, like I, secured with shackles. Yet these chains that bound him were unexplainably a joy to behold. This is the sermon title, Bound for Freedom, right? And it's a two, bound meaning two different things, right? You're bound, but you're bound. You're on your way. You're, you're bound to be free in God's eyes. As I left his office, it made a lasting impression on my psyche, not to mention my physical frame. Yeah, by the way, Frank was a really 
really frail looking guy, but don't let him fool you for a minute. <laughs> I mean, that guy could, could do what he needed to do. His wife, Doris, had given me a couple of small books, told me to read them in my spare time. They'd also given me Bible studies, you know, the Bible studies we give to people and, you know, take home and read this and bring it back. Well, you're supposed to do like one a week, right? Well, I was injured and I was really interested in what was happening here. I mean, something was different about this guy and you know, I wanted to know what the Bible said. You know, it was just, it was just the timing was right. You know, you know when the timing is right, and it was right. And so I was doing like six, seven of these Bible studies in a week. And they're like, we think you're going too fast. <laughs> I'm like, I was just eating it up. It was great. Um, and anyway, it was over a period of a year that Frank would share with me and um, I go on in this manuscript that I put together. <clears throat> then one day as I was reading, I had a close encounter of my own with Christ on the cross. It seemed that he was living and dying for me alone and going through literal hell so I would not have to. I began to weep uncontrollably. To think that Christ would do that for anyone was astounding. To think that he would do it for me, even while I was taking drugs and cutting corners with the law wherever possible, was inexplicable. For the first time ever, I bowed down and began to pray to Jesus as my personal Savior. As I slid down toward my knees, I felt the chains that had held me slither off as freely as a summer afternoon breeze. It seemed that he was living and dying for me alone and going through literal hell so I would not have to. I began to weep uncontrollably to think that Christ would do that for anyone was astounding. To think that he would do it for me, even while I was taking drugs and cutting corners with the law wherever possible, was inexplicable. For the first time ever, I bowed down and began to pray to Jesus as my personal Savior. As I slid down toward my knees, I felt the chains that had held me slither off as freely as a summer afternoon breeze. I began to feel a freedom and a peace I had never felt before. All the years of my life had been spent searching. Sound familiar to anyone? I had a desire for something better in this life, where drugs, money, the fast life had failed. Christ had succeeded. I, who was once doomed to despair, would now become a prisoner of hope wrote this poem not too long ago, well, well after this incident happened. Kings will come and go. Kings will come and rulers go and nations rise and fall. And none without God's watchful eye, but at his beck and call. The eyes of God run to and fro beyond our human scope. But past the veil of mortal minds, we are prisoners of hope. If death should come to loved ones dear, in faith we will not grope. Christ broke the fetters of the tomb. They are prisoners of hope. When chains that hold and bars that bind seem too much with which to cope, know that Christ felt this and more, O ye prisoners of hope. So when the world has closed you in, and you're at the end of your rope. Remember Christ's covenant of blood. You're a prisoner of hope. With fortress strong and blessings sure, we have no cause to mope. A waiting world must hear the news. They are prisoners of hope. So I'm baptized in Paradise Valley California, it's a sort of a suburb in the San Diego area, that's where I was. God had taken the initiative. I guess you could say I'd been knocked off my horse. I was kind of at a sort of a, you know, a low point, you know, just a point. God knew exactly what point, right? The timing was right. Um, he spoke to me. There was a call to action. And when you accept, he says, like he said to Paul, get up and go. And so I did. <laughs> and God is calling you. All of you here, I'm sure, are already 
I'm pretty sure most all of you are already Christians. You're already Seventh-day Adventists. You've already had some experience and come into God's truth. And so now God is calling you to get up and go, right? Maybe not to the, to the ministry as in the public ministry. It took a long time for that to happen uh, with myself, uh, my wife and I. Um, I can tell you some of that story also. But he's calling you to something, amen, to some ministry for him. First, he's calling you to that relationship with him. Then he's calling you to spread that out to, to others, amen? They are prisoners of hope. Well, I was there in San Diego area. My friends said, you should go off to college. Go, you know, you know go study. And so I'm like, okay, where should I go? I'm a brand new Adventist. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, this place, there's a place. I'm thinking, why, why send me to Virginia? So there's, there's this place in Virginia called Heartland College. You should go there. I'm thinking, now I'm looking back saying, why didn't they send me to Weimar? It's a lot closer, but they didn't. And so off I go towards Weimar, have another car experience on the way there because I decide, okay, I'll just make this drive in one day. It's a little long. So at about 2 o'clock in the morning, um, I start going off the road, and somehow I get back on the road, and I'm fine. But, I mean, it was quite a scare. It woke me up. You, have you had those incidents where <laughs> you're dozing off and the Lord wakes you up? My buddy, Clayton Leineweber, who was a church member of mine in California, called me the next day and said, hey, Pastor Rob. Oh, and I just said Rob because I wasn't a pastor then. He said, hey, Rob, did anything happen at about 2 o'clock in the morning? And at first, I mean, I didn't die or anything, so I, I didn't immediately remember. But then I remembered. I'm like, oh, yeah, I almost, I mean, I started going off the road, and I came back on. He's like, the Lord woke me up at 2 o'clock in the morning to pray for you. I'm like, wow. So off I go to this place called Heartland. And uh, actually uh, met Mike and Helen there. Uh, we were sort of classmate-ish. Um, anyway, I think we, we crossed paths at least for sure. But uh, quite a conservative school. Went there for a couple years. Great experience. Really had super experiences. Great teachers. And then from there I go to Andrews University uh, to finish up. Now when I, was at, when I went, I was going to be a teacher. That was my thought. Okay, I'm going to go into teaching. I love teaching. I love kids. It's be great. Well, all the classes that they were offering were like Revelation and Daniel. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> I didn't really have an advisor, so I just sort of took what I wanted to. So by the time I was done with Heartland, all I had was these religion classes. So I go to Andrews, and they're like, well, you can go into teaching, but all your classes are religion. I mean, you'll have to basically start over. But you could do a degree in religion and then maybe do a master's in education or something later. So I'm like, okay, so that's what I, that's what I did. The rest is history. Went into religion and uh, finished at Andrews. And while I was at Andrews, I worked at the dairy and um, have ever, any of you ever worked at a dairy? No. That smell does not come off. It just doesn't. I mean, I don't care how many times you change your clothes and wash. And, but um, another experience happened there that was amazing. They were pouring uh, some concrete new slab for something that was happening there, and I was helping, you know, you have to, you know, smooth it out, and, you know, and so forth. You guys that have done that know about that. And I was smoothing it out. I was underneath this, you know, the, the trough that comes off the cement truck, you know, that brings the cement down. Well, somehow that, that trough, that chute, the welds broke. The welds gave way on that chute. And that chute came crashing down. And, of course, it messed up our whole cement that we were just trying to pour. But I was underneath that chute. I have no idea how I how I'm here today. I really don't. But I remember that the, the manager of the dairy took me into his office and he was, he sat down and he was visibly shaking. He was just like, he's like, raw. He's like, somebody saved your life today. <laughs> so again, God was doing his thing and taking the initiative. Graduated from Andrews. Oh, by the way, Met my dear wife at Andrews. I could have gone to another college and had my four years paid, but something told me, no, you need to go to Andrews. You need to go to Andrews. So I'm sure that's, that's part, of, part of the reason there that, uh, that I went. But graduated, my wife graduated. Um, she's a PK. She's a pastor's kid, right? And so she didn't want to really live in a glass house, which is what the pastor's life 
can be sometimes, right? Um, and I, you know, although I had a degree in religion, um, we just didn't feel called to the ministry, right? So we moved to North Carolina. Actually, we were offered a position by Jay Gallimore in Michigan at that time, said, no, we're good. And so <laughs> moved to Michigan, uh, sorry, moved to North Carolina, and that's where both our girls were born. But God was always knocking, right? He was always knocking on our hearts. We were very active. In fact, I had three little churches, had a little circuit that I would preach at. I was a real estate broker. Um, my wife was a physical therapist. We were doing quite well um, financially, but God was, God was still calling. We knew there was something more. There was something different. Well, we were visiting in Tennessee uh, at a concert, a Christian concert there uh, at the Tivoli, and it was there that my wife said, honey, I think God is calling us into the paid, you know, into the full-time ministry. And I'm like, uh-oh. Um, so, by the way, gentlemen... When your wife has one of those moments, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> She's probably right. Um, but I prayed and I said, Lord, <clears throat> um, I've got to know this for sure. Please give me a sign. And now you might say, oh, it's wrong to ask for a sign. I don't know. I just know I needed to know for sure, right? So I asked the Lord that. We're back in North Carolina the next Sabbath. And my elder uh, decides to take me aside. This elder's name was General King. His first name was General. His last name was King. He was in the military for many years. Now, can you imagine being in a foreign country and your name is General King? I mean, what do you do with this guy? Do you bow down? Do you salute? I mean, anyway, he was an artificial heart recipient, just a prince of a guy. And he said, Rob, he said, can I take you aside? I said, sure. He's like, we've been praying about this for months, my wife and I, but we think you've missed your calling and that you need to enter the ministry. And I just looked up to heaven and said, okay, Lord, I get it. <laughs> That's clear enough. And so off uh, we went um, after that. Again, we said we'd never go back to Michigan. Never say you'll never go anywhere. Don't for a moment think that, oh, that's not for me or religion. I've, had, I've heard people say, you know, that's good for you, but it doesn't work for me. It'll work for anybody, amen? <laughs> I mean, we have to receive it, but it'll work for anybody. No one is beyond God's grace to change and to transform and so I hope you'll uh, know that. And the blind leading the blind, of course, Frank Nightingale was physically blind, but I was spiritually blind. And for God to seek me out in that state and pull me back to himself, I'm just ever so thankful, even now, for God's amazing grace. <laughs> 